Welcome to the Computational Medicine Podcast, where we discuss AI and computational tools being deployed in medicine. I'm Alex, a doctor working in London. Today, we're talking to Dr. Adam Batanai. He's co-founder of Span Health, a health coaching company driven by data to improve longevity. The company's primary goal was to enhance human performance by assessing members in improving their sleep, nutrition, and exercise routines through scientifically based experiments. In 2022, Span Health was acquired by 8Sleep for an undisclosed sum. What makes Adam particularly intriguing is his role as a pioneer in the field of medicine. While longevity is not typically recognised as a specialised area in the UK, Adam has carved out his own unique niche. Enhancing people's longevity and health span requires not only a comprehensive understanding of human physiology, but also a deep comprehension of behavioural psychology. Adam focuses on motivating individuals to take actions today that their future selves will be grateful for. In other words, instead of merely addressing problems as they arise, doctors like Adam strive to prevent or at least delay the problems from occurring in the first place. During our conversation, we spoke about Adam's journey and his approach to establishing Span Health. We also explore his methods for optimizing longevity. I hope you enjoy. Right, so thanks very much, Adam, for taking the time to chat to us today. Uh, so I'll do a proper introduction sort of when I go back and uh, look at the footage. But if we could just start with you telling us about sort of your background and how you, how you came to work on the projects that you're working on today. Yeah, so uh, thanks for having me. I'm uh, a medical doctor by training. I uh, trained in internal medicine, then did some training in oncology. Um, I did a master's in genomic medicine, uh, but I've always had this interest in in longevity. And what I mean by longevity is is kind of treating and preventing the core uh, causes of, of of chronic disease. Uh, which is which is aging and the manifestations of aging uh, as we grow older. Um, so that's been my uh, all-encompassing um, interest in medicine, but th- there isn't one kind of specialty that really looks at longevity in that lens. Um, so I, I, I kind of went through the route of internal medicine, oncology. Um, but uh, a few years ago, I started a, a company called Span Health, which is a longevity coaching platform, which looks at longevity from a, from a lifestyle perspective. So we used wearable data from Whoop, Aura, uh, Apple Watch, and all these kind of uh, smart devices that measure uh, your uh, bi- different biomarkers. Um, we use that data to give you recommendations based on sleep, exercise, and nutrition. Uh, and the idea was to do, we would give you a recommendation every week uh, and then measure the impact of that recommendation uh, on your on, on your wearable data um we went through multiple rounds of funding eventually we sold the company about a year ago to a, a company in the us uh, called eight sleep um i've since moved on and uh, started a new, a new uh, startup oh, it's we're only about six months old uh, numenor health and what numenor does is um is focusing on longevity but from a, a an actual pure medical and and, and uh, diagnostic uh, perspective so we, we, you can only go s- do so much with uh, kind of lifestyle um, and that's why i discovered with my previous startup because our users were um, you know bringing us uh, lab results they were asking for prescription medications they were they wanted to take that next step you can only, only go so mu- so far with uh, with you know optimal diet and nutrition and um, exercise and sleep so right now we focus on um early prevention of uh, age-related diseases and the way we do that is uh, it's a membership program where you pay monthly and you receive regular blood tests and lab tests Um, and the aim is to identify any early changes in your um, health markers that are related to heart disease, uh, metabolic health, uh, cognition and cognitive health and also cardiorespiratory fitness which we identify as the kind of core um, uh, the cornerstones of of, of um, healthy aging, um, and then we try to correct those early changes um, to optimal levels using um, some lifestyle stuff, but mostly prescription medications and and um, uh, and treatments. Fantastic. And my next question is quite broad, so I want to know what the uh, high what the highest yield steps that someone can take to improve their longevity is. I guess the, the, the way I, I would think about that is kind of uh, there, there are three broad categories. So there's mm. one category of uh, lifestyle and then mm. the second category would be um, uh, early detection and prevention. 
and then the third one is more kind of is more experimental and it's more uh, kind of futuristic which is uh, kind of anti-aging treatments that sl- target the pathways of aging so we can we can talk quickly about the the first yeah, one yeah. the lifestyle one the lifestyle one includes um, nutrition sleep exercise avoidance of harm and uh, stress management so um, under nutrition you know we can do a whole podcast about nutrition and mm. longevity but uh, I, I guess like the, the main pillars that we focus on is um, getting to a healthy weight first and then getting to a healthy body composition so we want you to have a uh, healthy fat percentage but also a high muscle mass and the reason for that is with aging we lose muscle mass and that's one of the kind of uh, levers that we can use um to to kind of prepare ourselves for for healthy aging um and we can do that through when it comes to nutrition um we can do that through optimizing calorie intake but also optimizing macro macronutrient intake and one of those would be um uh, macronutrients would be uh, optimizing protein intake which is actually quite uh something that is um quite commonly uh, under uh, consumed protein um and then the second one would be it would be exercise uh, and as everyone knows you know exercise is probably the, the the most important thing you can do when you when it comes to your mm-hmm. health and it's um it's a cheap form of 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 therapy but it's uh, um yeah you can't go without it it's like a foundational thing and exercise when i talk about exercise we we like to think about these things in kind of um different categories and different kind of uh, so when i talk to my patients about um uh, something like exercise um everyone knows that exercise is good but uh, what does that mean so i, I break it down to a kind of a, imagine a pyramid where the baseline of the pyramid is just movement throughout the day and reducing the amount of time you're spending sitting and that would be the foundation of your of your exercise so that would be measured through step count and it also can be measured mm-hmm. through um the, how many hours a, a day you spend sitting and being sedentary um more than eight hours a day of sedentary of sedentary behavior is is uh is is associated with increased risk of mortality um one every hour we spend um after i think seven hours a day increases mortality rates around five percent uh compared to uh every hour we spend before like less than eight hours um uh, so it's really important to just move throughout the day and increase your step count. You can do that by, uh, th- there are s- smart watches like um, Apple Watch has actually a, a good feature where it tells you, it asks you to move every hour and it, in order to close the rings. So um, that's kind of a foundation, right? But then just uh, being like generally active isn't enough because you need to push your body to to its limit. You need to push in order to build and and increase your capacity, your functional capacity. This is a general principle in aging because you have this like term of functional capacity, which is um, your how uh, how adaptive your your body is to loss of function. So, for example, your lung your lung capacity um, in your twenties is you know. Is it, your lungs have a certain capacity but then with age you start losing that capacity slowly um, now what happens with smokers for example is their lung capacity go, shrinks faster because they're smoking and damaging their lungs over time so by the time you get to your 60s 70s um, you have a lower a much lower capacity than someone who never smoked but then uh, what happens is you get a chest infection, for example, which hits your lung capacity. That uh, and then if you're a smoker, you don't have any reserve, so that can be a huge issue, which leads to uh, death in, in some in some cases. Pneumonia is a huge uh, cause of death in in the elderly because of that kind of loss in function, uh, functional capacity. Uh, so if you think about every system in your body in the same way, you want to build that reserve, you want to build that uh, and maintain that reserve throughout your uh, aging. And that's where um, exercise is a really good tool. So we said we talked about kind of the baseline of general movement, but then the second one would be um, building your cardiorespiratory reserve measured by VO2 max. And you'd want to do that through uh, a mix, a kind of an 80, 20% split of uh, 80% in your in uh, doing moderate intensity exercise like uh, jogging 
uh, cycling, uh, anything that you enjoy, because these are you'd want to do more than around 150 uh, minutes a, a, a per week uh, doing that kind of exercise, and then. 20% uh, and 20% of that uh, you'd want to spend in in high intensity exercises reaching zone 5 exercise which is 90% of your maximum heart rate um and, and that would give you a good balance between uh, kind of anaerobic capacity and aerobic capacity which are the two different pathways are uh, which our bodies use to utilize um energy um and then we want to build up on, uh, build upon that with uh, with increasing muscle mass through ex- through, through resistance training. Um, so those are the, the kind of uh, big areas. But then um, w- one area that is under uh, also underutilized is uh, flexibility and balance. So um, maximizing, we actually start losing flexibility in our. It's one of the earliest things that we start uh, losing, and. Um, it's one of the things that athletes use to prevent injuries. Um, that's why modern athletes actually, w- one of the reasons why modern athletes have a way lower um, injury rate than previously because they, they focus a lot on flexibility and they also are, are really good at early injury detection and prevention. Um, so flexibility and, and balance is, is, is a really important uh, kind of aspect of health as well. Uh, and then the final one I would say is maybe something like um, your uh, fast muscle fiber uh, or f- twitch fibers um, exercise, and those would be ex- uh, trained by uh, doing kind of explosive movements and maintaining that ability. Anyway, uh, um, we talked a lot about exercise and, and, mm. and nutrition. We can go on about <laughs> to the other yeah, areas. No, I'd, love of, to, I'd love to, love to hear more. Thing. Yeah, more, more, love to hear your cliff notes on nutrition as well. Obviously, I've heard you mention uh, in previous podcasts the uh, the the significant amount of evidence behind calorie restriction. Could you just expand a bit more on that and any yeah. other uh, nutrition uh, side of things that? Uh, yeah, calorie restriction, restriction is an advocate. interesting one because uh, in, in animal data, one of the most robust uh, experiments that can increase um lifespan in animals is uh, putting them on a calorie restricted restricted diet what that means is uh, lowering the calorie intake of the organism below what is considered um kind of uh optimal um so in humans that would be below the rec- recommended daily um calories from the US R- 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 RDA guidelines now this is a uh, a tricky point because it, it can only it should only be done under the guidance of a of a of a of a nutritionist or a specialist in this area because it can lead to um, uh, malnutrition mm. now the way we would do it is we would measure um, different areas of of of, um, of nutrition through blood work and also through body composition and other markers um, and we would do it gradually. We would start with a baseline and then we'll gradually reduce the person's calorie intake. And what happens is your body actually recalibrates its metab- metabolism and resting metabolic rate to um, accommodate for the lower calorie intake over time. And you can do it, you can, so it's very modifiable, your, um, your, your nutritional requirement. Um, and uh, calorie restriction has been shown to improve multiple markers of health. Obviously, one of them being um, body composition and weight. Um, uh, other ones being things like um, lipid, uh, blood lipids, uh, blood pressure, uh, all these different markers of, of general health. But the problem with calorie re- restriction is that it's it's very difficult to implement. Most people find it very difficult to go on a calorie restric- restricted diet. It requires a lot of discipline. Um, so. It's not. It won't be the uh, easiest uh, easiest thing to implement with people. Um, that's why kind of finding ways around calorie restriction by, uh, or maybe even pharmaceutical uh, ways of of enc- encouraging calorie restriction, especially in people who, who have excess weight or, or obesity, uh, like Zempic, for example, and different uh, uh, medications that can help people suppress their appetite and go into a calorie deficit, are uh, in a really interesting area of. Um, of interest of mine 
Fantastic. And throughout your work through uh, Span and uh, and your, your current new startup, uh, what have been some of the best uh, interventions that you've seen that improve people's adherence to these lifestyle changes? I've heard you mention um, group, uh, group groups before, and I'll just give you one example of um, j- just that the I found recently that, that's actually helped me exercise a bit more. So, uh, you know, for years... Uh, you know, when I was at university and had a lot more free time, um, I could I could go to the gym and uh, eat mountains of chicken and rice, had loads of time to make chicken and rice. Now I'm working uh, on a medical rotor. It's a bit more tricky. Um, it was so so. So I joined CrossFit maybe six months ago. And obviously it's it's got this sort of uh, cultish association with it. But my my one has like a 15 pound fine if you don't show up to the 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. classes. And good Lord, you know, it, like I, I think of myself as a relatively motivated person ish, but prior to prior to this you know set the set the 6 30 a.m alarm to be there for seven to be out of the gym for eight to be at work for nine um snooze every like every single time but that 15 pound fine um you, just just gets you through the front door like no no one yeah it, it's quite it, it's um no one's quite with a lot of these things it's uh it's not a matter of more information but just actually changing your behavior to to follow through with it and for, for, for me in, in particular the 15 pound crossfit fine helps but I want what have been your um, what have been the biggest insights that you found in both diet and exercise uh, on that front? Yeah, I think that's a that's a good point because I mean, and this was, it has been backed with evidence. So there was a large study done in Amsterdam um, where they looked at a large uh, group of people and they categorized them based on their kind of activity level. And they found that people with the highest levels of activity were people who are doing social um, sports. So people who did, uh, who played tennis, who played football, um, and different kind of uh, sports that were social. And mm. you know, the implication here is that probably that probably increases your your um, adherence, and it just makes it more enjoyable for certain people. Now, I think there's a lot of individual variability. Some people, uh, I personally. Um, like to go to the gym on my own. I don't. Uh, I, I do do some uh, like social activities w- when it comes to sport, but my main source of exercise is just stuff that I do on my own. Uh, whereas other people find it very difficult to to stick to something like that, so they they need that kind of social environment. Mm. Um, so I I think it, I think the answer here is kind of there's a lot of individual variability. But w- when it comes to what we found at Span is that um, the types of, of, our, of people who used our service were more likely to be uh, very regimented. Um, and what we tried to minimize was uh, variability from day to day on the types of exercise you do um, in order to see if, if, the chain, in a, if any one change would, would show an impact on your, on, your, um, uh, on your metrics. So for example, uh, targeting, blood pressure or targeting, resting heart rate is a good one. Um, does uh, focusing on zone two training or high intensity training um, impact resting heart rate differently? Um, and we actually found that probably uh, the, the, probably doing more, um, kind of a mix of, of zone two plus high intensity training has a better effect on resting heart rate. But the, but the bigger effect was doing um, high intensity training, which is kind of consistent with literature. Um, high intensity interval training is, is the fastest way to improve your VO2 max and, and to improve your cardiorespiratory fitness in general. Um, yeah, when, when it comes to diet, um, there's a lot of also individual variability. It all uh, it comes down to uh, what's your final goal. If your final goal is to lose weight, then we can you know focus on strategies to bring you into a calorie deficit. Uh, for some people, the final goal is to, is to put on weight and put on muscle uh, mass for example so that would require a different you know dietary strategy mm. and what what sort of strategies have you seen effective for say um weight loss with um uh where yeah where people are looking for that outcome um so right now we do we, we do use uh, with some people with like pharmacological interventions to help them uh, suppress their appetite like uh, semaglutide um which is quite an effective drug in suppressing appetite with pe- for people who uh, want to lose weight but are struggling to um, kind of modify their diet. They've used different, so uh, usually these types of people will, will be 
quite overweight and they they've had a very difficult relationship with food um where they go on binge cycles and then they go uh, they sometimes they go into calorie deficit they lose some weight and then they so they cycle between the, between these two different states and uh, zempic is a really good medication here because it can uh give you an extended period of of discipline um it reduces that uh, kind of emotional impact of of uh, or relationship with food um until you reach a a desired weight and then with the nutrition and exercise coaching that uh, these patients go to uh, go through we can bring them off uh, zempic into a more kind of healthy healthy lifestyle so that's kind of a one uh, one uh, case but i think in general yeah, the number one dietary intervention that we uh, used to implement at span and i still use, use this a lot with people is increasing protein intake Interestingly enough, the recommended daily uh, requirements for protein uh, from the U.S. dietary guidelines are actually um, misunderstood and at best and maybe at worst uh, completely wrong. So um, I I tweeted about this the other day uh, about how the um, RDA is, uh, I think the recommendation is 0.8 milligrams of protein per kilogram of body weight. Um, but when, when, when they've done stu- studies sh- uh, comparing different groups of people on different um, protein, uh, kind of different, different, with different protein intake, the people who follow the RDA with 0.8 uh, milligrams per kilogram showed a decrease in muscle mass without, even, uh, without change in their, in their exercise schedule. So that shows that that's probably inadequate. And the, you, you're you're probably better going up to 1.2 um, milligrams per kilogram, even more than that. And it depends on the level of activity. So up to 2.4 milligrams per, per kilogram of body weight is probably um, more optimal for people who are, you know, exercising and, and want to increase their muscle mass and doing resistance training. So that's probably the number one intervention that is easy. And it also... Um, Increasing increasing protein intake uh, does also increase uh, satiety with a lot of people, and it can, uh, in many cases, lead to kind of hel- healthy uh, healthy change in their body composition and even uh, muscle uh, or even w- weight loss. And which wearables do you see in the near future becoming the most useful and widely used? Interestingly enough, I think Apple Watch might be. <laughs> the biggest player in the future um despite them not being like widely adopted in the kind of uh hardcore biohacking community uh i think they're going in the right direction they seem to be focusing more and more on a- adding the the features that um the more niche wearables are uh have um so i i, I would i would i would put some money on, on apple but also the problem with apple is uh, apple watches no one likes to wear an apple watch at night so it's it's, it's not great at uh, tracking sleep um so I, I think there's room for uh, different wearables on different parts of the body other than the wrist and and and, and rings uh there, there's probably room for innovation there i'm not sure where but uh i would like to see an invisible kind of tracker that just tracks without me feeling like i'm wearing something uh, one of the interesting things about eight sleep for example is that it measures your sleep markers while not being a wearable you just sleep on it um, so that's one thing that i like about it and that's how i measure my sleep i don't actually wear any wearables at, uh, to bed mm. uh, uh, w- one thing that i would like to see is some kind of subjective or objective measure of of stress uh, there are some wearables mm. that are looking into this. Some wearables have claimed to be able to measure cortisol levels, um, but with, you know, unconvincing evidence um, as a proxy for for kind of chronic stress. Um, but I think that would be an interesting one. Uh, HRV is kind of a, a crude measure of stress. So you could say that HRV is, 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 it could be a measure of stress. Um but it would be interesting to see kind of um, different measurements in that in that uh, arena. Brilliant. 
And you've mentioned previously that finding a community was quite important in the early days of Span Health and that you tried a couple of different platforms and that Twitter ended up being the most useful one, uh, sort of the, the top of your funnel. Uh, why do you think the why do you think Twitter was the best platform for you over? So our platforms? users were 90 percent male um, and Twitter does skew male, but it also uh, it skews towards people who are more interested in information. Uh, people use Twitter for entertainment, but mostly because they're kind of looking for information. They want to stay up to date on the re- relevant trends mm-hmm. in their fields or um, in the world. So I think that overlaps well with the persona that we use because we, we, we used uh, a few different uh, kind of top of the funnel marketing uh, techniques, one being uh, Instagram, Facebook, and, and other kind of um, marketing techniques. But we, we found that Twitter was the, w- w- was the best one for us. Um, also, uh, just do, creating content on the website in, in the form of blog posts was, was quite successful as well. Um, <clears throat> and I think it's just the kind of the, the typical Twitter user. Um, one thing that I'm experimenting with now is, is doing more content on LinkedIn, which actually works, I think, uh, as well as Twitter as well. Um, we haven't mm. done paid LinkedIn advertisement yet, but it's something I'm kind of putting more effort into understanding. Mm, brilliant. And could you talk a bit about what your motivations were behind moving from medicine into the startup scene? Like what was going through your mind at the time? Um, what were your feelings and uh, and how do you fe- how are you feeling now on the other side of it? Yeah, I, I've always been a bit of an entrepreneur, but I, I think the main reason is I, I kind of put it like this. Uh, there's kind of like uh, two ways, two ca- w- categories when it comes to careers and, and uh, um, you know, life plans. There's either a very defined career such as medicine, where, you know, you finish medical school, you go into your first training and then you maybe subspecialty training and then uh, you become a consultant and then you, you know, progress in that way. Um, it's the same thing in academia. You become a, you know, you go down that route, you do your PhD, you become an assistant professor, then a professor or whatever. Um, but there's this, these less defined uh, career paths like becoming a, an entrepreneur or an, a content creator. Um, and I think uh, there's a certain type of persona that isn't happy until you kind of go into that kind of creator, builder um, career path. Um, and when you find yourself in a very defined, rigid career, uh, you won't be happy until you, until you kind of experiment in the, in the other realm. And that was me for a long time. Uh, but I also am very passionate about medicine and healthcare and longevity. So um, I, I found a way to bring these two together to build something related to healthcare. Although like, healthcare in general is is probably the worst industry for our startups. It's it's a it's a very di- it's very difficult to build startups in in healthcare. It's very diff- mm-hmm. difficult to scale. Um, it, it's it's just like a crappy <laughs> a crappy place to build. But um, you know that's why. It only attracts people who are, you know, actually, you know, passionate about it. Otherwise, they'll be doing some kind of uh, SaaS product for, um, I don't know, <laughs> um, something easy. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, just the the, re- the regulation around it as well, like the regulatory hoops. Um, uh, it, it it makes sense that it's so heavily regulated, uh, it, especially it in the UK. Like, unfortunately, like it's very the private market in the UK for, for healthcare is actually quite small. Mm. Um, so if you're building for the UK alone, uh, you're probably not going to be attractive for VCs. You're probably not going to be, you know scale very fast. People are people expect healthcare to be um, you know government funded here. So it's very mm. difficult to start something f- privately funded. Mm, mm. Yeah, agreed. And uh, could you talk a bit about the process that you went through when you were choosing your co-founder? Sort of, um, yeah, like uh, like what thoughts were going through your mind? Um, how how long between, say, that initial uh, meeting and discussing about the, the project that you guys wanted to work on and uh, and how things moved on from there? Yeah, that was it. Was interesting how I I met my co-founder at my previous company. I uh, was new in London and I uh, was looking to meet people in the startup scene, but more generally in the healthcare startup scene. Um, so I started uh, reaching out to people. I I started indexing all the different healthcare startups and healthcare entrepreneurs 
I found on AngelList. AngelList is a kind of a LinkedIn for startups. Um, and I started reaching out to people, uh, just offering um, kind of consulting services for free. I, I gave them my background, my interests, and I was like, you know, um, is there anything I can help with? I got on a few calls with a few people. I got I, I met with a few people and eventually met um, Patrick, who was my previous co-founder. He was working on a different project at the time, which he uh, eventually didn't go through with. But, you know, we developed a relationship. Then we got talking about um, what became our, our company. Um, and that's how, how that's how that relationship started. And it also started from kind of me helping him with personal health issues, which kind of translated into, oh, we think there's a product here. So if I'm mm. going through this issue, there's probably other people going through the same issue. Which, by the way, turned out to be the wrong assumption. <laughs> yeah. And was he from a conversational background? Your so he uh, is a software engineer. He's a uh, yeah, he, ex Microsoft, ex Stanford. So there was a lot of complementary skills between us. And me coming from a healthcare background, him coming from you know a very much tech background. How did you find the collaboration between you with your clinical expertise and your co-founder with their computational expertise as a software developer? Yeah, it, it was a good match because I was able to focus on kind of building the clinical product. So my role was I called myself chief medical officer or chief science officer but basically what my role was uh, to uh, translate uh, so to, to look for um, interventions that may be able to change to improve markers biomarkers that we that people cared about so when when someone downloaded our app they would connect their bio wearables and they we would give them a dashboard showing their data so my um, role was to first of all fi- figure out how to portray that data and display that data to the person that in, in an understandable way and also how then what recommendations do we recommend to the person uh, to improve that data so we built this huge library mm. of that translates kind of um, crude data into actual uh, concrete recommendations that can help people improve their health and my Great co-founder's sense. role was to obviously, you know, build that into a more kind of uh, algorithmic mm. way, and, and to build that into the, uh, and to build the, the back end, the, the tech side of it. Looking back on it, was, that, was there anything that you would change to sort of make that entire collaboration process work a bit faster or a bit more effectively? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think I was lucky that we actually got along pretty well, but I think what we we weren't good at, especially in the beginning, we weren't good at uh, iterating fast enough and we weren't good at, enough at uh, kind of mm. uh, using feedback to change directions um, qu- quick enough. We ended up pivoting uh, around a year in and we could have done that faster. Mm, mm. And I guess that was a matter of you say you know like the lean startup or uh, speaking to anyone in the or you know Imran or people in the startup space. You come up with a hypothesis. You go and test that hypothesis. I think X product works in the market. You go and test that product. You get data. You you fine tune your hypothesis. So was it a matter of looking at your data, thinking okay that this idea that we have we're seeing. Uh, yeah, I mean that's that's that everyone knows that, but the, the actual it's it's actually not uh, as straightforward to actually. Uh, mm. translate feedback into uh, changes in the product because yeah. you get feedback say someone isn't they're not using this feature or the uptake on this feature is bad their feedback is is, is terrible mm. on this certain experience uh, so then you kind of need to create a, a hypothesis based on that but you, there's like 10 different directions you can go so which one do you go yeah and uh, then how long do you test for and uh, what uh, what feedback are you actually measuring? So when it, mm. when it comes down to the details, actually, and, and I'm still not the best at this, but um, it's it's quite um, you know it's not as straightforward as just saying oh we tested this and then the feedback was this and then yeah. we changed that kind of process. Uh, you you actually kind of you, you can do it too fast as well. So it mm. needs to be it, it needs to be right and it needs to be, it depends on the product as well. And I guess a, a part of it is sort of going with your gut, going with your intuition. You've got 10 different options of things that you can change about your product, but um, you, you have to you have to make a decision. So you 
make the best decision you can um and for for a lot of decisions there's not going to be a lovely um a lovely chart that shows you oh, i've got great feedback on this feature you've just got to uh, make the call and and i hope it's the best one for I, I can imagine that's that's also a big part of it yeah exactly yeah um and i mean i'm still not the best at this but um th there is also a role for kind of um building what something that people will want despite them not knowing what they want so there, there you need to do you need to also have a vision you can't just you know blindly follow what the data tells you um so it's a, it's a fine balance between the two mm, brilliant um and just talk just a bit about selling yourself and pitching yourself to investors um what what do you think were the most what were the the most useful skills that you had when pitching yourself to investors because they you know they sit you down they grill you they say right what's the size of your market um how do you know that what sort of um uh, what what etc what's your penetrant market penetrant is going to be um so so yeah what were what were the the most useful things you found in making that process as effective as possible so i think getting across the core value of your proposition is actually not as easy as people think uh, one way that we learned to do it with time, and this was mostly with dealing with American investors, uh, they're very good at kind of, you know, prompting you to improve your messaging, um, was mm. to start with the user uh, and then explain the user journey. So how does the, so what's the, ha, so for example, at Span, um, our user was, you know, someone in their 30s who works in tech and that person has bought a wearable and they're looking at their data. There's some irregularities there. Their HRV is too high. Their um, sleep is, is bad and they, they don't know what to do. So they start Googling. They find like a million different articles on a million different topics and they, they, they can't trust anything um, and they don't know how to implement these things in a structured way. Uh, and that's when they find uh, something like Span where we offer, we show that we can actually improve your metrics with, you know, a, a, a personalized coaching experience. So they download the app, uh, they, and then they, they sync their data, and then they automatically receive kind of a report make, helping them understand their data better. And then they, they receive a, um, an experiment that, will, uh, sh that is linked to one of their um, data points. So, for example, take this supplement or do this certain activity during, during the during the day, um, and we're going to track its, its impact on your sleep quality. They do it, and then a week later, their sleep quality improves by thirty percent. So that kind of story that I just told now is a very mm. uh, uh, kind of of or a very clear way of explaining what our product does, the value of the product to the user. I could have said. Uh, we're a platform where that provides data that you know analyzes data and provides personalized, um, you know, a personalized coaching experience. Uh, but that doesn't really convey like the actual uh, core of the of, of the value mm. to the user, right? There's loads of platforms. Mm. So, what, so what's different between you and your competitors? There's just too much there. And as an, as an as an investor who is, you know looking at uh, similar or like different pitches every day uh, it can be very d difficult to convey that in piece of like the very, the most important piece of information in a short period of time we were part of a uh, <clears throat> a program by um, Jason Calacanis uh, who was a, a big angel investor in the US um, mm -hmm. and they were big on kind of uh, teaching us how to pitch to investors in a short period of time. Um, we learned a lot on, on how to convey that message. That, so I think that that was something that we started getting really good at towards the end. Um, and the idea here is not really to, you know, trick investors into giving you money. It's more like, how do you actually convey the value of what you're doing? Because, you know, if you have users and you, there's, um, you've been, you know, you've been able to assemble a team, you have uh, some funding behind you, there's a obviously some kind of value that you're that you're uh, that someone is receiving from you so you really need to like understand how to portray that to someone in, in under three minutes 
Um, so what? So uh, yeah, they're, they're, I think that accessing high quality information just on on all of these topics is uh, is, is really tricky um, for e- even for those in the medical field. What do you think are the best resources that uh, consolidate new research in the longevity space? I get asked this question a lot, and like I think about like where do I get my new information? I actually get it mostly off following the right people on social media who share mm. uh, kind of studies and up-to-date uh, information. But I also uh, look up things. So, for example, I would look up, you know, a certain metric or a certain area of health that I'm interested in. And I, the way I would do it is I would just literally do a search on uh, PubMed or on Google looking for research articles um, on, this, on the topic. Um, so I, I don't think there's one area that depends on the, the area of, of that you're interested in. So th- there wouldn't be like one website that I recommend to go to. It's more of a kind of who are the sources that you follow. And then, um, you mm. just need to proactively be like, be, uh, searching for the, you know, new information, uh, as a, as a medic, you know, conferences are the, are, are where the new research is, is presented so you know if you're an oncologist for example you would go to a few co- uh, international conferences a year and that would be your source of kind of up-to-date information mm. amazing and what are your thoughts on david sinclair's book lifespan and peter attia's book outlive yeah i have both of them um i i'm uh, i'm definitely more of a fan of uh, of peter attia uh, and outlive i bought outlive and sent it to every single member of uh, of, of of Numenor because I think it's a it's a very valuable book to mm. and it really explains the concept of longevity in a uh, actionable and uh, you know with the least hype possible. Whereas uh, David mm. Sinclair is obviously you know a very esteemed scientist and he is a, more of a visionary and he his vision is more of a kind of uh, um, futuristic vision of longevity there, there aren't that many like his actual takeaways from the book uh, aren't actually I, I, I don't agree with like things like uh, you know reducing uh, protein intake and uh, um, you know focusing on, on supplements that I don't think are actually backed by evidence like resveratrol and a man um, so there's a lot of, so I when it comes to David Seclair I, I actually wouldn't take kind of uh, um, actionable advice from him, but I hope mm. that his he succeeds in his endeavor of you know with the cellular reprogramming, which is you know might be uh, the uh, the frontier in anti aging therapies in the future. Because um, you can only even w- with the current medications and current lifestyle modifications that uh, even if you're completely optimized, we're never going to be able to live more than 120. Um, so the only way for like for us to really radically extend human life is going to be through um, kind of futuristic technology like uh, cellular reprogramming, epigenetic reprogramming, which is the stuff that people like David Sinclair are working on. So um, although I think there's a lot of hype around his work mm-hmm. and maybe too much hype, but um, you know I I hope there's something there. But when it comes to a kind of practical um real takeaways i would definitely go for kind of outlive by uh, peter it it's a fantastic book and are there any other books on longevity that uh you, you'd highly recommend i, I generally i i don't like uh, books on health um just because it's such a rapidly evolving field and it's um by the time any book is out a year later a lot of it is obsolete, so I won't get actually information from books. I would rather just, uh, you know, read research papers and uh, keep up to date that way. Mm-hmm. And are there any approaches that you've had to your work in general that you think have been useful along the way? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not the best at ex- executing effectively, but things that I think I do well are, you know, finding the right people, motivating the right people to kind of work with me on different projects and kind of being able to let go of parts of the project that I feel I'm not con- I, I I I can't provide as much value to. Um so that's one area and and the second one is is kind of reducing the time between idea and execution. So like um 
I might I might do this even too to I take it to an extreme where if I have an idea and I want to you know start a project I start straight away and maybe I kind of leave the um, technical the kind of you know for example starting a company you can focus on um, you know uh, registering the company on company's house then building a, a website and co- building a team fundraising all of that but eventually you're going to hit the wall of um you're going to need customers you're going to start selling to real people so you can kind of uh, focus on the things that f- make you feel like you're doing work uh, or you can face reality and and actually start like uh, uh, you know selling to comp- to to actual customers um and a lot of people spend way too much time on the on the easier stuff rather than like facing reality and getting out of the building um and actually, you know, uh, talking to actual customers and trying to sell them. Uh, I tend to like just start with the that part, and then if that part works, then I, you know, go and do the mm. um, the more, uh, you know, the easier stuff. Mm, great ethos. And last question: So, do you have any advice for students or young people in their careers? Yeah, I think so. That whole thing of you know defined careers versus undefined career pathways, I think it's it's very useful early on to think to think and um, really kind of uh, decide which type of person you are. Because I think you won't be happy if unless you're if you're a type a builder that if you're a type that is a builder um, and you thrive in kind of these uh, undefined um, ecosystems, you you just won't be happy if you're in a a very defined career path um so you know make that decision early on and take a risk to to go into it and i think like increasingly with um with things like ai and uh, the more defined pathways are, are becoming it's less valuable to become even a you know a, a very experienced person in these defined pathways and it's way more valuable to be experienced in less defined pathways in entrepreneurship content creation um these different areas so building those skills and and taking risk and going into those areas um is probably something that i would encourage and in general i think what younger people way overestimate the risk of not going into a a predetermined career and doing something like starting a business Vir- the the risk is virtually non-existent whereas people think oh you know i'm going to you know, what are my peers going to say i'm going to lose like two three years it's like if you're in your 20s you have years to lose like who cares um yeah. and the benefit the and you can know and it's actually like a career path now or career move to, to do a startup for two years and then use that as a portfolio to you know get a get a job that you wouldn't have even gotten if with like two years of experience um so it's actually you're actually not even you know losing any uh, time you're actually building much more experience than you would um even in 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 a in a you know in a 9 to 5 career Absolutely. It makes me think, reminds me that of that point just met, reminds me of um, a Tim Urban, wait, but why post about Elon Musk, where it was called like the chef and the sauce, like worst case scenario, you, you start a company, it goes wrong. Um, you, you know, you've lost some pr- social prestige, maybe. Not really. I mean, there's even like people, people start companies now bec- to, to have that social prestige. Like it's, it's become, it's a, I don't think it's true anymore, you know? <laughs> I mean, if anything, some people shouldn't start companies. If anything, uh, a lot of people should uh, probably go into like careers. Like, uh, it's, there's nothing wrong with it. But I'm just kind of adv- advocating for, not even advocating for more people to start companies. I'm more, I'm more likely to say, you know, really be true to yourself and know like which type of person you are. And there's no, there's no, there's no right or wrong here. You might be the, the the type of person who, you know, will thrive in a, you know, become the best. Um, you know, uh, expert on whatever niche or sub- subject that you are that you want in a certain field, and go through the the, the defined career pathway and just become really good at that. Uh, even sports, like um, becoming a footballer, is a very defined way. For example, um, you train and train and train and become b- better and better until you become the best, or you know, whatever. Um, so there's nothing wrong with that. It's just you know it's good to know early on what type of person you are and yeah and and factor that into your decision making 
Thanks to Dr. Bass and I for taking his time to speak. You can find links to his work in the description. Thanks for listening and catch you next time.